Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. As stated at the end of my last video, a part 2 on the lost history of the Sphinx was necessary, because there is still so much more to reveal, and the true story of the Great Monument is more complex than I thought. It's time to cut through all the noise, and look at the facts plain and simple. I stated in my last video that the Sphinx had been renovated, and not just in the past 100 years, but also by the Romans, Greeks, Ptolemaics and the 18th dynasty Egyptians. The first half of this video will look at why I don't think the Sphinx was originally a lion, as I show amazing photographs, some of which you will never have seen before, to try and prove my point. The second half I will give my own hypothesis and timeline regarding the origins of this enigmatic structure. I think the Sphinx was created by the dynastic Egyptians, but when I say created, I don't mean that a beautiful lion was carved out of the natural limestone to face the rising sun. I mean that the dynastic Egyptians turned an enormous lump of highly weathered jointed limestone into a lion with some modification, but mainly with the addition of huge amounts of masonry, and this I'm sure is known to Egyptologists. Although I love the work of Hancock, Boval and others, I don't think that we're looking at an ancient lion monument from 10,500 BC, that rather majestically gazed out at Leo, rising in the east, that was carved out of the bedrock by a lost ancient civilization. and we also aren't looking at the amazing sculpturing skills of the dynastic race. No, we're looking at a lump of weathered bedrock, with a shaped head and four masonry legs. I'm also sure that the Old and New Kingdom masons of ancient Egypt patched up some of the gaping holes in the structure, and also to make it more lion-like and presentable for the masses. Surprisingly, I'm getting a lot of my new evidence from Egyptologists, on a website that has published the findings of the ARCE Sphinx Project of 1979-1983, as well as images from the restoration in the 1920s, and hopefully this video can put an end to us looking for the age of the Sphinx through analysing the weathering, because it may well be irrelevant information. The only question we really need to ask after this video is when the lump of bedrock was turned into a Sphinx. But before we get too far ahead, let's look at some evidence. The Sphinx as we can see from these old photographs is a badly weathered limestone monument. In my past video I showed these two images, which show the scale of the erosion, which in parts far exceeds the erosion on the Sphinx enclosure wall, something I will explain later in this video. I have since come across this image taken pre-restoration in the 1920s, and we can see the rear northwesterly corner of the Sphinx where the back foot should be, yet all we see is bedrock, a pile of rubble and old masonry from some point in history. In the bottom right of this picture is limestone bedrock, with some blocks inside for stability, but I see no evidence for a back foot ever existing, and certainly not like we see it today. To further back up this claim, here we see inside one of the back feet of the Sphinx, and we can see that it's just natural limestone with huge amounts of added blocks and rubble, built up to create a foot. Here again we see a back foot and inside of it, just blocks and rubble built onto the limestone bedrock. I don't deny that this work could have been done by the dynastic Egyptians, my point is that the back foot was not carved from the limestone. Here is another picture looking down to the back of the Sphinx. Like the photo I showed in my last video, we see the huge fissure that cuts through the natural limestone and separates the rump from the body, as well as the huge amounts of weathering, and we can also see the ancient restoration work that turned the outcrop into a lion. The back foot here is 100% a masonry construct, built onto the natural limestone. Here we are looking inside one of the pores, and you can see the layers of masonry very clearly, and here again we see modern blocks, older blocks, and rubble making up the foot. In this image we can see right into the back right paw, and again it proves that it was 100% a masonry construct. Now let's go to the front paws. Here we can see from behind the dream stealer, and as well as an unknown metal hatch directly behind the stealer, we get to see inside the front paws, and we can see layer upon layer of blocks. This is also seen in these historic photographs from the 1920s. We are told that the most ancient masonry, especially around the back of the Sphinx, is Old Kingdom, which therefore proves beyond doubt that the Sphinx was not a carved monument by the Old Kingdom dynastic Egyptians, because there would be no need to cover up and restore a freshly carved statue. As we can see here, the bedrock the stones are covering up is already incredibly weathered, meaning it was very unlikely that the statue was ever freshly carved. Here we see another great old photograph of the front left paw showing ancient masonry covering up or restoring even more ancient blocks, and this picture from above really shows the true makeup of the front paws of the Sphinx, 
I have hundreds more images that show that the four paws of the Sphinx were added to an already highly weathered limestone hill, but when they were added is anyone's guess. My next video after this may just be a reel of images played to music so you can browse through them yourself, but my conclusion after looking through them all is that the Sphinx was not a carved lion or a jackal, it was just a shapeless weathered limestone mound in its earliest form, natural rock. With masonry added all around the elongated mound, masonry creating a tail and four legs, all of a sudden we have a lion. A clever piece of construction work, but by all accounts this was no structure or statue. This is the true Sphinx, as recorded by the ARCE Sphinx project of 1979 to 1983, showing the Sphinx with all the artificial blocks removed, but after the concrete has filled in the huge fissure in the back. This is what I believe it would have looked like in the Old Kingdom. The head is a debatable subject, and there are a number of different hypotheses, and we can debate this forever without anybody ever agreeing, because it's impossible to prove. The head is made of harder limestone, so even before any work was done on the Sphinx, what the first people would have seen is a hard nodule of limestone sticking up from the eastern end of a badly eroded mound of limestone. It would have looked like a natural anomaly, very similar to the rocky outcrop seen directly north of the tomb of Kenkawe, as well as other strange phenomena seen around the world. Based on my interpretation of this image from the Norma palette, artwork that commemorates the Horus kings conquering Lower Egypt, I think the nodule of harder limestone was carved into a head in pre-dynastic times. Therefore the Sphinx in its earliest form may well have looked something not too dissimilar to the temple in the HG Wells film Time Machine. The theory of the head is just my idea, and if true, it means that the hill may have been an iconic structure for these pre-dynastic people. The upper portions of what is now the back of the Sphinx were probably exposed above ground at times when the sand had blown away, just like we see here in this picture. But sometimes maybe just the head was seen poking out of the sand like here. Even if the pre-dynastic people of Lower Egypt didn't shape the harder limestone nodule into a head and my interpretation of the Norma palette is wrong, there would still have been a natural lump of craggy limestone above the sand, standing like a natural wonder and we do see many similar natural geological wonders around the world. So, based on the images that have come to my attention that show that the Sphinx mound was never a true sculpture of any kind of animal, I don't think the Sphinx was originally a lion, a jackal or an animal of any kind, at least not until later in dynastic Egyptian history. It's just an assumption based on limited physical and historical evidence. People may quote the inventory stealer and its reference to the Hollow of Horan, but this specific name for the Sphinx was not known until the New Kingdom, and therefore it isn't saying that this rock identified as Horan or Horamaket in the times of Khufu and Khafre. The author of the stealer is simply using the landmark's New Kingdom identity to explain the position of the Temple of Isis. So, what about the hypothesis that the Sphinx was a lion and looked out due east towards the constellation of Leo in 10,500 BC? Well, as stated, there is absolutely no evidence that the Sphinx was a lion in its earliest incarnation. There are no signs of ancient paws or a Sphinx head or mane in the natural limestone. Furthermore, the first known association between the lion and the constellation of Leo was in the reign of Hatshepsut in the 18th dynasty, where we see a Sphinx posed lion in the correct place for Leo on the astronomical ceiling of the tomb of Senenmut. But this was in the 18th dynasty and not the Old Kingdom or pre-dynastic times, and certainly not 10,500 BC. We simply do not know if anybody prior to the ancient Egyptians thought that Leo was a lion. That in itself is a leap of faith. Constellations have changed their animal, human and godly associations numerous times in the past 5,000 years, and the fact is we know absolutely nothing of any civilization that may have existed in Egypt 12,500 years ago. Yes, maybe the pyramids are this old, but obviously there are no inscriptions or writings of any kind associated with these amazing structures. But it's one thing showing that the Sphinx was nothing more than a natural anomaly, but it's another thing proving it, because the main argument against my claim is the perimeter wall of the Sphinx enclosure, which marks the limits at which the Sphinx was dug out. The enclosure is one giant quarry, and the ancient people who dug it out clearly left the elongated limestone mound in the middle for a reason and the limestone perimeter wall, the limit of the quarry, apparently shows clear signs of rainfall erosion, and so therefore the body of the Sphinx has to be 6, 7, 8, 9 or 10,000 years old, the time when it last rained hard enough in Egypt to cause the erosion. If true, you could argue that maybe it was a lion, but is so ancient that all the wind and rain erosion has simply weathered away the pores and distorted the body.
Again, after reviewing the evidence, I simply don't buy this. If the Sphinx is so old and so heavily affected by rain erosion, then why isn't the erosion uniform across the entire Sphinx complex? Why is the so-called rain erosion far more prevalent on the south and west walls, and far less obvious on the monument itself, as seen on these old photographs, which shows that the Sphinx is clearly dominated by wind erosion? The few vertical striations on the Sphinx are not water channels like we see on the enclosure wall, but are mainly geological fissures. Yes, there is some evidence of rain erosion on the Sphinx, but what we see is very minor, and nothing compared to the enclosure walls. Yes, you could argue that the later wind erosion could have certainly rubbed out the older rain erosion on the Sphinx, but if this was the case, it would surely happen across the entire complex, not just localised on the monument itself. The blocks of the Valley and Sphinx temples are also wind eroded primarily. There is evidence for water erosion, but there is very little evidence for rain erosion. The blocks used to make them have been geologically proved to come from the Sphinx enclosure, yet these temples do not show the same rain erosion of the enclosure walls. So, what's going on? How is all this possible? The truth is that these vertical gullies on the enclosure wall indicate surface runoff, basically water draining off the Giza Plateau and not specifically rainfall. Everybody thinks that it has to be rainfall, but in ancient Egyptian times, Giza would have been covered with water every year from the Nile inundation, and due to the topography of the land, when the Nile receded, the excess water on the plateau would run one way downhill. Looking at topographic maps of the Giza Plateau, this means that in the vicinity of the Sphinx on the plateau, water would have run west to east towards the Nile, meaning it would have cascaded over the western wall of the Sphinx every year. At some stage, a prominent drainage channel was installed to direct any potential rainwater or flash flood water from the Giza Plateau into the Sphinx enclosure. The drainage ditch, approximately 2 metres wide and 1.5 metres deep, runs along the north side of the Cafre Causeway and goes into the Sphinx enclosure at its southwestern end. This was a purposeful act. The Old Kingdom Egyptians wanted to fill the enclosure with water. Occasional downpours did and do happen from time to time in Egypt, and were certainly more common at the beginning of dynastic history when the climate was milder. The water enters the enclosure at the southwestern corner, but if the quantity of water was greater than the channel could hold, such as from a torrential downpour, the water from the plateau would avalanche over the western and southern sides of the ditch. If the channel was blocked at a later date, maybe in the Middle or New Kingdom, which is possible as there was a piece of granite found where the water enters the Sphinx enclosure, then all of the water from the north side of the Caffrey Causeway would end up tumbling over the western and southern walls. As Robert Temple also points out in his book, The Sphinx Mystery, the Sphinx enclosure is likely to have been dredged on its southern and western sides as well, which would also explain the localised so-called rain erosion. For all these reasons, this is exactly why we see the localised water erosion that we do, and also why we see a distinct lack of water erosion on the Sphinx monument itself. The monument, as well as the enclosure wall, has spent most of its life under the sand, so the rain erosion theory means we should see evidence of it on the Sphinx. And we don't even see half as much as we do compared to the enclosure walls, but we do see huge amounts of wind erosion, which I believe proves it is just an old natural mound of limestone and not an ancient sculpture of any kind. When the excavators cleared away the sand around 100 years ago, we see a very badly wind eroded sphinx, but a mixed water and wind eroded enclosure wall. There is very little rain erosion evidence on the sphinx, because it hasn't rained in Egypt for thousands of years. And if the monument was a sculpture made by man, and it really was that old, then due to just how soft the limestone is, any possible remnants of rain erosion, whether on the monument or enclosure walls, would have also been rubbed out by now by wind erosion and sandblasting. The water erosion on the enclosure wall is not 12,000 years old, it's probably just Old Kingdom, because geologically, this is the only way to explain the lack of water erosion on the Sphinx itself. The true way to date the Sphinx enclosure's quarried walls is to date the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple, which are made of the blocks out of the enclosure. These blocks are not showing rain erosion, and therefore are not thousands of years old. There is no real physical evidence to suggest they aren't Old Kingdom. They are wind eroded and the limestone is very soft. They could be older, they could be pre-dynastic, sure, but we're not talking thousands of years before dynastic history. So I think the Sphinx enclosure is most likely Old Kingdom in origin. As a structure, it is nothing compared to the Great Pyramids of Giza. It's not even in the same league with regards to craftsmanship. The Sphinx is a natural outcrop, quarried away, and also possibly slightly shaped, with four paws made from masonry added. 
and the masonry has had renovations in the New Kingdom, Ptolemaic, Roman and modern eras, which we can say was not necessary for the far superior pyramids. It is my opinion that the pyramids are the oldest monuments on the Giza Plateau, and as structures they are far more impressive, and that is why the Cafre Causeway forms the southern boundary of the Sphinx enclosure, giving it such an odd shape. The Sphinx enclosure fits around the existing causeway, the causeway didn't go around the Sphinx. So, taking my theory a stage further, we have to ask ourselves, why was the Sphinx dug out in dynastic times? Well, there is evidence that the Nile River extended all the way to the Sphinx Temple and Valley Temple, and there are ancient keys located here, and this is even confirmed by Egyptologist Mark Lehner. This would mean that the water table would have been substantially higher than it is today, which today is about 6 metres below the surface. There were also obvious drains and water channels inside the Valley Temple, which means they did need to control the movement of water in the temple. I believe the Valley Temple was some kind of temple, but the Sphinx Temple I'm sure was a kind of boathouse, another idea championed by Robert Temple for various reasons I'll go into in a future video. Maybe it was built to hold the sacred Henu Bark boat before it sailed around Rostow in the ancient Old Kingdom festival of Sokar, something I have discussed in previous videos. The stone around the Sphinx was quarried to build the Valley and Sphinx temples in dynastic times, and when the Nile River rose in height during the inundation, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that the Sphinx enclosure may well have filled up with water, leaving the exposed elongated mound of limestone in the middle of the lake, another idea proposed by Robert Temple. As we can see, there is no wall on the enclosure on the eastern side, but the Sphinx Temple's western wall formed the eastern wall of the Sphinx enclosure, and the water entered the enclosure between the Sphinx and Valley Temples. This isn't too far-fetched, as the Nile River has even reached Giza in more recent times, and we know the Nile was a lot closer to Giza in history before it migrated eastwards. Temple does go on to say that the Sphinx moat could have been filled all year round, maybe manually, but after the inundation, the water table would have been lowered, and any water inside the moat would have escaped. Huge geological fissures cut through the entire enclosure, and there is no evidence that the walls were lined with an impermeable layer, but of course it's certainly possible. The Egyptological view is that the enclosure was dug out to create the Sphinx, no other reason. They quarried the bedrock to sculpt an enormous Sphinx lion-like statue, using the excess stone to build two temples in front of it. But I think the Old Kingdom builders were planning something else. They did leave the island that would one day become the Sphinx for a reason, and I don't think it was to create a lion or a jackal. Furthermore, up to half of the jackal or lion could have potentially been underwater, not perched on a pedestal in the middle of a lake, which would be more fitting and certainly achievable if they just quarried down a few more feet. With the help of further drainage channels, the builders could have ensured the animal or god was never touched by the water, but could have looked to be almost sitting on it. Surely this would have had a greater visual effect, and would also have been more respectful to the god. If it was a lion or a jackal, you would also never see its paws through the murky water, and the monument would need a huge cleaning job quite often. So, what were the ancient Egyptians doing? Robert Temple champions the idea of the Sphinx being Anubis with a dog-like body, whilst Graham Hancock championed the idea it was a lion. I will champion the idea that a simple mound of rock was left within the enclosure on purpose, but its importance relates back to the earliest dynastic religion of ancient Rostow, which many of you will know is the ancient name of the ritual landscape of Giza. The lion versus Anubis argument is not for this video, because after reviewing everything, I think it was neither but obviously it did become a lion in the Middle or New Kingdom. Personally, I think the long nose and ears of the jackal would be impossible to carve out of the bedrock, and geologically speaking, I don't think there was enough rock for a proportionate lion head. I think it was originally a human head in pre-dynastic times, maybe a pre-dynastic god or king, but in the Old Kingdom, as the dynastic kings were building on the plateau around the more ancient pyramids and turning Giza into a sacred landscape for their own gods and religion, the Sphinx symbolised something else. I will go into this in more detail in a future video, but to recap on some previous work, Giza was home to the annual festival of Sokar, the prime god of Rostow in the Old Kingdom, the god who would one day go on to be absorbed into Osiris. In Memphis and surrounding regions, Sokar was the patron god of the necropolis, and was known as he of Rostow. During the festival, the Henu Bark boat would be paraded around Giza and then descend into the underworld a symbolic opening which some believe was at the end of the causeway, known as the Wall of the Crow to the south of Giza, inside the modern cemetery, but with further research I believe it was actually somewhere else, which I will mention towards the end of this video.
Robert Temple and others suggest that there is evidence that the Valley Temple was actually a temple of the god Sokar, which I'll go into in a future video. The evidence suggests that the Sphinx Temple next door was a boathouse, so where better to keep the sacred Henu Bark of Sokar used in the festival than inside a boathouse next to Sokar's dedicated temple. The Temple of Sokar was believed to have housed a golden statue of the god that was loaded onto the Henu Bark for the festival. So, the Sphinx enclosure was dug out, and the blocks were used to make structures dedicated to the god Sokar. A major icon often associated with Sokar is a falcon head extending from a mound, which some believe represents the ancient Egyptian primordial mound, the Benben or first piece of land that was surrounded by water. Therefore the entire Sphinx complex in the earliest Old Kingdom times I propose was dedicated to Sokar. And therefore, after quarrying out the Sphinx enclosure, I think they kept the natural limestone mound, aka the Sphinx, and maybe enlarged it in their quarrying by digging down. I believe they actually recarved the old human head into a hawk or falcon. And interestingly, the Nama palette shows a hawk or falcon taking what I interpret as the Sphinx in its earliest pre dynastic form captive. The falcon or hawk head didn't need to be in proportion to the mound, as if you look at these old depictions of the Henu Bark, you can see that the falcon head simply tops the mound of Sokar. The development of ancient Egyptian religion is a complicated subject, but to the 18th dynasty Egyptians, the Sphinx god Horomachet was worshipped as a falcon, a lion and a sphinx. Interestingly, the main animals associated with Sokar were the falcon and acre lions. Is the new kingdom Horomachet, aka Horus in the Horizon, a development of the more primal Old Kingdom deity Sokar, which was clearly the original dynastic cult religion of Giza? The falcon head of Sokar is sometimes seen with a sun disc on top, and as is seen here, it stares out into the horizon. As we know, Horus and Horomachet were both falcon headed sun gods as well. So, could this be possible, or is it all just a coincidence? I'll finally end this video by revealing where I believe the House of Sokar, or the entrance to the underworld, actually was. And it's actually thanks to a line from the Dream Stealer that today stands between the paws of the Sphinx. It reads, Then the hour came to give rest to his followers, at the limbs of Horamaket beside Sokar. The Sphinx complex was originally dedicated to the cult of Sokar. We have the Temple of Sokar, aka the Valley Temple, the Henubark Sanctuary, aka the Sphinx Temple, and the Sphinx in its original incarnation was a representation of the primordial or funerary mound with a hawk or falcon head on top, the main icon for the god Sokar. So now we need to find an opening in the ground close by, and what do we have directly west of the Sphinx? An enormous opening in the ground known as Campbell's Tomb. Here is the House of Sokar the entrance into the underworld in the Giza sacred landscape. As stated at the start of this video, the Sphinx in its earliest incarnation was never a lion or Anubis. I do believe it became the sacred mound of Sokar. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.